60 miles east of Monterey, California. And this is what a lot of the neighboring land looks like. And I always crack up that we're working so hard to try and figure out how to colonize Mars because we're just two plants away from being on Mars here. In the uh, summer, they'll till this into the ground and we'll just be one plant away from being on Mars. So we have the technology to, to, uh, and the skills to, to, to make Mars on this planet. So I don't know why we need to bother going out there. Um, this, is, this is vineyards. There's literally thousands and thousands of acres of vines like this. Um, this is the most important slide I'm going to show today. So um, if you just pay attention to this one, you can fall asleep after that. Um, <clears throat> This is some work that the NRCS did in, in uh, North Dakota. And actually, there's a YouTube video of, of them taking these samples and doing this, this work. These are core samples, and it's the same soil type. And all of these various practices are about 200 feet from each other. Um, and what they did is they took a core sample, they pulled it out, and it's, they photographed it. And here you can see the different, the different practices. This first one closest to me is using managed uh, uh, Plant grazing, uh, some of you know it as, uh, as holistic management. Um, and then the second one is using season-long grazing where they're set stocking, they're putting the animals on, on the ground and usually leaving them throughout the season. So they'll be there about anywhere probably from two to six months. And then the last one is just recently converted to cropland. That's the first year of converting that land into no-till corn. Um, and you can see what happens to the soil there. Uh, one of the really interesting things they did then is they put a they did a um, a water infiltration test where they put a steel ring into the soil, and they did it at each one of these sites, and they put an inch of water on there, and actually you put a piece of plastic in there, you pour your inch of water on, you pull the plastic out, and you time how long it takes that water to go into the ground. Um, so this uh, converted cropland, the the time it took for an inch of water to go into that was 31 minutes. Um, the continuous uh, season-long grazing took seven minutes. Any guesses on this one? 10 seconds. So, um, and, and, and this is a fairly dry area. I'm in a dry area. We average, uh, well, the historic average was 12 inches of rainfall a year. We've been closer to around six lately, except for the past two years. So when I see something like this, this is really what's telling me why we need to integrate livestock into cropping practices. And this is, this is touted as the best thing we have going in cropland right now. No-till. Um, this is some work from a guy by the name of Gabe Brown, who's been farming for a while up in North Dakota. And the thing that's really interesting here is, is, is what's happening over time. So we started out in, in uh, 93 using no-till. And this, is, this graph is basically showing the increase in carbon in his fields. And so you can see it, it, he's getting a slight rise um, and going through the years. But then he starts doing some interesting things. So he starts doing cover crops. He gets a little tiny bump from that. And then he goes into multi-species cover crop and livestock integration. And that's where you really start shooting up in your carbon. So he's been documenting his place for a while. And I wanted to show that because a lot of the stuff that I'm gonna show you is fairly new, what we've been doing at Picinus Ranch. <clears throat> this is another thing, uh, uh, some soil tests done at Gabe Brown's place, and actually in, in that area. And there's, there's, we've got uh, four or five different things going on here. We have organic, uh, no-till with low diversity, so it's probably just one crop, soybeans or corn or something. Then we have uh, no-till, medium diversity, and high use of synthetics. Synthetics are pretty common in, in no-till using uh, both uh, herbicides and synthetic fertilizers. And then no-till, high diversity, no synthetics, livestock, and cover cropping. Um, this is Gabe Brown's, by the way. And so it's interesting to note the, uh, the, the levels of of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and organic carbon. And one of the things that's really interesting is Gabe Brown uses no fertilizer at all. 
And so he's getting these increases in all these nutrients in spite of not using fertilizer. So um, it's, uh, it, this is all tied into the soil microorganisms. And so it's a, it's a pretty fascinating thing that's occurring there. And again, another reason why we should be looking at these systems. So we're in a, we're in a bit different system than Gabe Brown and, and probably and, and what a lot of you guys here are, are working with. And, <clears throat> um, but the principles are gonna be the same anywhere. Um, basically what we're trying to get away from is this reliance on fossil fuels, on, on equipment, on inputs of any kind really, and monocultures. And so we're looking at what, what, is, what does nature do? Nature uses a diversity of plants, they use uh, livestock, and so we're going from this, this outside input based uh, system to one that's based on solar energy. Um, one of the advantages is, so we, we're pretty heavily focused on sheep right now in a lot of our operation. We have both cattle and sheep, but um, the, uh, using something like sheep or any livestock really, but sheep and goats are especially prolific. Um, you put two of them together and pretty soon you've increased their numbers pretty dramatically. Um, we've been trying to do that with tractors for a long time and it just doesn't work. <clears throat> and this is what it all comes down to. It's, this, it's about the carbon cycle. And how do we get carbon cycling from the atmosphere back down into the soil, in which case it comes back up and, and we can keep that cycle tighter. And this is all we're trying to do is mimic this cycle. So I'm gonna talk about um, three, different, three different practices that we're doing. So we're working with, with wine grapes, we're working with annual crops, and we're working in converting annual cropland into a mixed perennial annual system. So first off, I'm gonna talk about the, the vineyard systems. Um, again, we're just trying to utilize solar energy and um, livestock and green growing plants to cycle carbon into the ground and build the soil health. Uh, one of the things we're doing in mimicking nature is, is looking at what occurs, uh, at least historically. Um, there are a lot of bison in this country. There are a lot of elk. There are a lot of deer, a lot of pronghorn. Um, in California, actually, we didn't have that many bison just in, in one corner historically. But um, throughout the, the rest of the country, uh, bison were pretty dominant. In California, we had a lot of elk in particular. And you can see they even got um, pretty close to where we're at right now. Uh, we've since, of course, reduced that down pretty dramatically. Um, how many livestock producers do we have here? Does anybody here, or do, does everybody here understand overgrazing, the difference between overgrazing and, and proper grazing? Okay, good. Um, this, is, this would be an aerial view of a vineyard. So the vines tend to be in rows like you saw at that first slide, and we're looking down on it. And so again, we're just, um, grazing sheep and vineyards is pretty common. It's probably been happening since, since there were vineyards. Um, and we're just focusing, just like you would do in, in a plant grazing and high density grazing, we're keeping our animals pretty tightly bunched and moving them frequently, as opposed to, this is what tends to occur in a lot of the vineyards, that they have them, uh, grazing similar to that third slide we showed with the soil cores where they're, where they're kind of spread out and in there for a longer period of time. Um, again, if we're thinking of this, of the, of the vineyard, of our system is solar based, we're looking at, this would be looking at the vineyard from the perspective of, of sunlight. And we just have these narrow strips that we can capture the sun. The, again, the historic practice is to, um, is to till these areas. Um, this is a vineyard in California that has been grazed and it was set stocked and this was some of the worst overgrazing I've ever seen. If you just step right outside the boundary of the vineyard, the cover crop is this high and they put the, the animals in here and left them in there for probably about three months. Um, the woman who actually leased the sheep to this particular farm was in a presentation I gave a number of years ago at Eco Farm and she came up to me afterwards and she said, I know that place, that was my sheep, wasn't it? And I said, it was. And she said, I had no idea that I was doing that. <laughs> anyway, so this is some of the early, the early work I did grazing in vineyards. This is a, a young vineyard that was near 
uh, a sheep ranch that I was managing. So we leased sheep out to this place and we would just run them during the dormant season of the vines. Sheep love to eat grape leaves and they'll just devour the plants. So we move them out of the vineyard during the, uh, w when the vines start to bud out. So this is, this is winter time and remember we're in a winter rainfall area and that's when we get most of our growth. So this is probably about January. We put the sheep in there, grazed it down. They were probably in there for just a day or two. And then we took them out. And you can see they make a little bit of a mess. Fortunately, we unhooked all the drip lines so that they wouldn't break them. So that's the, that's the common way of, of grazing vineyards in California now. But, and so I've worked in vineyards. The first vineyard I put in was in Arizona. And um, so I've worked uh, and I've put in since a couple of vineyards in Arizona. And then um, in Mediterranean climates is the other place where I've spent most of my time. But what I'm showing here is basically this box is showing the, the, when you have to keep sheep out of the vineyards in either climate. And the, the purple here is the growing season of the grape vines. And the green is when we tend to get the rainfall and thus the forage growth in our cover crop growth in the vineyards. In both cases, we're missing a big opportunity because we have to keep the sheep out on either side of this. And so when I first, when I first started planting vineyards, my big question was, how do we get sheep in there and what would happen if we were able to keep the livestock in there throughout the growing season? Um, the normal practice is, is you let the cover crop grow up and then you till it into the soil. We do know that in pretty quickly, I think it's uh, like within a week, we lose 80% of the carbon that we've tilled into the soil there. It gasses off. Um, so that's something that I tried to, wanted to try and get around. This is actually a biodynamically managed vineyard in California doing some great things, but they've still got the tillage. So they're still managing like that far slide we, we saw, which was, was actually the no-till, but they're still doing the same kind of destruction to the soil. So again, how do we get out of that? So this is what I came up with having worked uh, with planned grazing for a while and electric fence a lot. I set up two hot wires on either side of the fruiting zone. This is the dormant season, and this is what it looks like during the growing season. So these wires are in there. That keeps the sheep from grazing anything above here. The fruit's gonna be right up in here, and we get suckers on grapevines down below here, and that allows them to eat all of those suckers. Um, by doing that, we're saving a lot of hand labor, and they did all of the floor management too. So this was the first trial that I did on integrating livestock into a vineyard. Yep. Are, are you, do you have a shepherd out there that's controlling them in a mob? Or is it so we, we have fen we're using We're using net fencing in these. Yep. Yeah. You've had a lot of problems with the sheep rubbing on the bark or on the vines. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've actually not, so that can be a problem if they're, if they're small and they can break them down. Otherwise, what I've found is they do rub on there, especially in the spring, because these are hair sheep. They'll rub their wool off, and then the uh, birds come and take the wool and put it into, the, uh, into their nests. Um, I haven't had any problem with a vine being broken because of the sheep, but if there's a small vine in there, I'll put some type of protection around the vine itself to keep that from happening. But so far, I haven't had any, any vines break. Um, so this is the control site. And that's the vineyard site again. And I just wanted to show a difference in the management. So we, there's, there's no tillage occurring in there. There's, um, there's no input of, there's no herbicides. This was managed biodynamically. There's no, um, uh, so we didn't have to have any labor for suckering. There's no fertility inputs added into this. On the, on the control side, this was probably getting disked, I don't know, um, at least three times uh, in organic viticulture, we actually have to use more tillage than in conventional because we don't have the option of herbicides. And so we tend to have about 20 to 30 passes per row per year for all the various practices that need to occur. And you can also see the suckers here. And I didn't have to touch a single sucker in that trial. Um, so this is the only slide that I have some words on. But basically, I just wanted to go over some of the benefits that occurred from that trial. Um, we completely eliminated the tractor passes. We, um, we eliminated the need for suckering. Uh, this was one of the big surprises. We reduced irrigation use by 90% in that trial. 
And at the same time, we had an increase in yield, about a 30% increase in yield. According to the winemaker, it was some of the best quality that he's seen. Um, we were a little bit concerned. We did blind tastings of the wine from the various years, and we were concerned because we had sheep in this vineyard for a while that we might get off flavors, that it might taste like sheep urine or something. But actually, we had no issues with that. Uh, we didn't have to haul in any, any outside sources of fertility. Um, and everything that is we consider a problem in conventional, and by conventional, I'll include organic in that, everything we consider a problem becomes a resource. So this really flipped things around for us. The overall cost savings per acre per year for that trial were $450. That was in 2011. I've since talked to a lot of uh, grape growers in uh, New Zealand, Australia, and the States, and a lot of them said that I was underestimating that, and it's probably certainly true now. Um, I wrote an article on my work in this trial. It was rejected by every viticulture magazine in this country. Uh, Australia, New Zealand grape grower, Ryan Maker put it in their next issue. And um, I asked them, you know, I, I said, I've been rejected by everybody else. Why'd you guys put this in? And they said, well, it looked like a great idea. And we are, um, we're in our 20th year of a really serious drought and we look at everything we can. So um, consequently, the first commercial vineyard to adopt this is in Australia, it's in uh, Victoria. And this is a, a photo from them. They're going into their fifth year now and just heard word back and it's exceeding their expectations. Um, Common perception is tillage is required to conserve water in agriculture and in vineyards anyway. Um, what do you theorize why that turned out to be just the opposite? Okay. Are, are we on now? Should I be repeating these questions? Okay. So, so the, the, the question is, um, the, the common thinking is that we need tillage to conserve water in agriculture, basically to eliminate the competition from the other vegetation. And uh, there's, there has been research done now, and um, uh, I think the SIP may have done it in, down in um, San Luis Obispo that shows that there is no loss from, uh, from the cover crops. So I think that what that is is a, and it kind of makes sense when you think about it, but uh, just from kind of a, a, a surface in, interpretation, but when we really look at how you know, the, the carbon cycle and all those things work, we're really losing water by doing that. So, and this is, this is showing that when, when by that, but in, that uh, reduction in irrigation use that I was able to get by, by um, not tilling. And so other people are finding that out as well, too. Do you and, see any change in the vigor? In the vigor of the vines? Um, I have not noticed any change in the vigor. So they stayed, the sheep stayed in the vineyard until about the end of June. And I actually kept them in there a little bit longer than I wanted to, to test the electric deterrent system. Electric fence, as probably a lot of you know, it's a psychological barrier, it's not a physical barrier. And so we trained the sheep to the electric fence before anything butted out. And um, I just shut it off towards the end of the year when there was basically nothing to eat and there was throwing a little bit of hay to them. And they, um, they after about, two weeks, they had not taken anything off the vines, so we knew that that psychological barrier was holding. So yes? Is there, so you take them off the, out of the vineyard at the end of June. Do you need a certain interval of time before harvest for the food safety concerns? Okay, so, so the question is, uh, do we need an interval after taking the, the sheep out, or, or, or between taking the sheep out and harvest because of food safety issues? And the, all, all of the vineyards that I've worked in are, are certified organic or biodynamic. So I had to go through CCOF to see what their, what their thought on that was. And initially they said, no way, you need at least 90 days. They reinterpreted their, rule, their rules after looking at what we were doing here. And so now we can graze all the way till, until harvest. And actually we, wouldn't, we weren't allowing New Zealand wine. They were using leaf pulling briefly during the summer. It was certified organic in New Zealand, but they weren't letting them use it, that certification here because of that. And that was changed when, uh, when I gave this presentation in New Zealand and told them to talk to CCOF. 
and they got their regulations changed as well. So in, in regards to the whole food safety thing, this was no pun intended low-hanging fruit to work with because alcohol, no, 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 um, no pathogens are surviving al alcoholic fermentation was one of the ways that we got that through there. Um, so that was, that, was a, that was an interesting trial and we looked at, um, we, we demonstrated that we could get some pretty good results by doing this. Um, so the next thing was, is that how do we design systems so that we are working within the context of using animals? And what, we, what I was doing was modifying systems that were never designed for animals. So that's why we had to put <clears throat> electrified deterrent systems in there. And so then the, the next idea is, is how do we design these systems to work for, um, for grazing? So one of the first things we did at Piscinus Ranch was to develop a list of principles that we worked by. If you guys go to our website, um, you can see all these. I think we are, have about two pages of principles. But they're, they're, they're pretty basic things like reduce or eliminate tillage, increase biodiversity. So if we have these as our guiding principles and we design something to work within this context, what does it look like? Um, we use holistic management, and so we're using this, this framework for decision making to help guide us in our design process. So this is the site at Piscinus Ranch where we decided to design and, and, and put in a vineyard to be grazed by, by livestock. And so the, uh, I'm gonna show you a, a kind of a chronology in time. This is the site we selected. And we selected this site because we have a few perennial bushes here. And in, this, in our climate, the perennials tend to be on the north facing slope. So this is north facing. And so we looked around to find a spot that indicated that, okay, this would probably be a good place to plant, plant vines. Uh, the first thing we did was, was kind of level out the land and smooth it out. We have a lot of squirrels there, so we had a lot of squirrel mounds. And we put, up, uh, we put out about, uh, oh, about a sixteenth of an inch of compost. Um, we didn't put out a cover crop before the rain started, and we grazed it. And we, we, the first year we grazed it, we had six animal days an acre. And since I think we, we have a pretty savvy group here about livestock, um, basically, that just, that, that's just a, a term for how much forage we took off, the equivalent of six animals per acre per day. Um, we use a grazing chart. We use grazing, I've been using grazing charts when, grazing, when custom grazing vineyards. And um, so we planned our grazing. Um, and I just wanted to sh show you guys this again. We're trying to mimic nature. And you can see how close that is, pretty much. Um, we just have a different species here doing the same thing. So the second year, we planted a cover crop, and we had a little bit more rain, and we got 67 animal days per acre just with the cattle. So we're already increasing our, um, our soil organic matter and our productivity there. And so that's just, that's just the preparation stage for the vineyard. Um, at the same time, we also ran sheep in, in, in just in the site that we were going to plant the first year. The total site is 25 acres. We ran the sheep on the, uh, on the 12 acres that we planted the first year. And we lambed out there. Uh, second year, we had, again, more productivity. And here's the idea. So a typical vineyard, your vines are going vertical. And we just decided to go up and we would go horizontal. So we raised the fruiting zone up to be out of reach of the, of the sheep. And uh, we were spreading the vines out a little bit to increase the shade. Um, one of the things that we're designing for is the reality that we're getting increasingly drier and hotter there. So by coming up, we reduce our potential for frost and um, we cool the vines down a little bit. So we sat around and talked about how do we increase, increase our, our, our diversity down below and, the, uh, and increase the uh, capacity to, to support sheep. So this is, uh, this is probably April of this year. We set up this trellis and we're still running sheep in there. We haven't planted anything yet. 
And um, next year, we planted part of it this year, and next spring the whole thing will be planted. And we'll be working on training the vines so they get up higher there, and we can graze that at any time of the year. Um, a couple things to note, we, do, we, have, we, we have some third party monitoring doing uh, soil testing there. And the first two years of getting this site prepared, we increased our soil organic matter by 1% per year. So we're, we're, we've increased it by 2%. Uh, this last year, given the rains we had, that increased our water holding capacity by 320,000 gallons on 12 acres. Uh, it 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 varies wherever you are, and and depending on how much. Um, the question is, what is a good stocking rate for sheep? And that's a pretty common question, but it just it depends is the answer. And when we're when we're doing planned grazing, we're looking at what the what the what the carrying capacity of our land is. And so um, that year, it was we probably had a, a th oh probably our our stock density was about probably about 300 animals per acre or so. And it varied. I mean, and we were using net fencing on this so we can adjust it however we want. And what do you do for predator protection? We have, the question is what do you do for predator protection? We have guardian dogs and we use net fencing. Use livestock guard dogs. Um, the next thing I'm gonna go to is some of the cropping that we're doing. This is uh, basically what was occurring there. We have about, 570 acres of irrigated cropland. Um, it's all leased out, the whole ranch. So the ranch is 7,600 acres. Uh, everything is certified organic. And the cropland was leased out to a, um, to a large organic company. We realized pretty quickly after I started working there and talking with the owner that in spite of the fact that it was certified organic, that the soil was being mined. And so we've decided as those leases expire, we're taking them over and, and taking on the, the, uh, the cropping ourselves. So we do what we know best at this point anyway, which is um, we put in a, it's a, um, we put in sprinkler lines here that are semi-permanent and they're plastic. And we planted it to cover crops, both annuals and perennials and we are going to gra we graze that with cattle, and we also grazed it with sheep. And so we're, we're finishing and fattening animals off of this cropland while we increase the soil health. We're finding that going from conventional tillage, conventional organic tillage, to um, we're, we're no-tilling all of this, we're no-till no seeding all of this, either with broadcasting or using a no-till drill, that we have, when we, when we transition, we have this dip and the forage quality actually goes down for a little while. And we're starting to work back up because we're in an area. I understand that in no-till systems, it usually takes about three years to going from till to no-till to improve your soil quality. So I'm thinking that because we can grow year round here, we'll be able to do that in about a year and a half. And our, our relative feed value has gone up about 100 points in uh, from last February until the middle of the summer, this last summer. We planted a, a cool season crop and then we grazed it down and went into a, um, a warm season crop that we know tilled directly into the cool season crop. Um, the, the warm season crop got pretty big actually. They were not on their knees. Is that CBM? Uh, it was millet and actually what was that? What was in there was, was the the small seeded stuff was Johnson grass, which we removed. <laughs> um, so so that's what we're doing with that system that I just showed you. Is um, we're going our, our plan our long term plan is that we are going to be planting trees probably every 120 feet in, in these long strips, and we'll be doing a diversity of trees things that do well in that area like apricots, persimmons, pomegranates, and things like that. And we'll also put some things like mulberries and some taller trees in there to provide shade for the animals. One of the things we realized is we're constantly asking how do we make life better for the animals here. And in spite of the fact that they had everything that they could want to eat in there, they would look up to the hills during the middle of the day and want to be in the shade. And so 
we, we've started moving them up into the, into the hills during the middle of the day so that they can have their shade, which dramatically improves their happiness. And, but we want to bring that down into there. We want to integrate the, the perennials into there to get the, the variety of root architecture, to get more carbon cycled into there, provide shade for the animals, aesthetics, biodiversity, all of the things that uh, are kind of part of our principles for, for management. So the, um, and we will probably start planting trees in there within another year or two. We're trying to get the soil up to a level where the soil successional level where, where we're dealing with um, is right now is basically is, is suited to annuals. We want, we want to get the soil healthier so that when we plant trees, they're better able, they're, they're, they're better, the, the soil conditions are better for them. This, uh, this last thing that I'm going to talk about is the farming that um, my wife and I did in Colorado. And we're up at 7,600 feet. We're on uh, center pivot. Uh, so that's those big sprinklers. If you fly over to Nebraska, you can see the circles down, the, down below. So, and we were grazing that using mob grazing. We were getting really good results. Uh, and we started wondering, what if, we, what if we were to put some crops in here? And so um, what we decided to do is just take a, a strip of that area. This is how we were grazing the cattle. We're moving probably anywhere from two to seven times a day. This is a lot of fun to move these cattle on these systems. We just, you know, move the, move the hot wire over and we were able to get uh, really, real nice animal impact. So what we did is we just took one of those, this is just a portion of that circle. We took a part of that and devoted it to um, to planting vegetables. We did about 60 varieties of vegetables in there. And the cattle were still grazing the rest of this. And this is in buckwheat. And what we did was just took this section out. Um, we didn't do any tillage on here. We did, um, uh, we, so we just no-tilled our seeds directly into the ground. And so a couple things, this is 7,600 feet in elevation. We have a, the ground freezes about four feet down every year. So, um, and there was only, there was a little bit of alfalfa in here, but it was only annuals. So all the annuals were gone. So we didn't have, we didn't really have weeds to deal with so much. Um, and again, one of the reasons we didn't till is, I, I, and this is another slide showing, I've, I've had people say, well, I do hay land, so I think I'm okay as far as soil quality. But you can see here the difference. One side doing plant grazing, the other side pulling the hay off. Just pulling that hay off is reducing your, your, your soil quality there. And we, we had been pulling hay off of that ground for a number of years. We hadn't for about four years previous to when we planted the, the farm. Um, again, we had about 60 varieties of stuff growing in there. Um, and pretty exceptional quality. The, uh, one of the reasons I was excited to do this is because of the bricks we were getting off the forge before doing this. And it, it, it transferred to the bricks that we were getting off of the, uh, the crops that we were growing in here. That's one head of lettuce. <laughs> so we got, we got pretty amazing size, quality. Those are Brussels sprouts. And we sold most of the stuff to Denver, to a wholesaler in Denver. Um, during, oh, probably towards the end of the summer, the main buyer called up and said she needed to come out to the farm. And I asked if everything was okay, and she said, yep, I just want to see what you guys are doing. And so she came out, and I told her everything we were doing. And she was, had started the, that produce company that was buying from us. And she went back and resigned and decided to go into farming full time. She had been farming part time and integrating the animals on her farm. So um, that was probably one of the best compliments I've had in my farming career. Um, I'm going to talk about quality of life, but first I'd like to see if there's any, any questions from the group here, because I've, I've gone over a lot of stuff. And if anybody has any further questions. With a shovel, <laughs> and, some people. and some people, some of these people, <laughs> and uh, we didn't have very much. We just noticed that there was a few in there. It, 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 yep. So, so we just got it out right away. Yes. How do you provide water? 
Okay, how did we provide water to the sheep? Um, we put a water in, in the, it, it depends on where we're at, but in the cropland, we are putting water systems, burying a water line under the ground that is separate from the sprinkler system in order that we can operate both at the same time. And, and uh, those, the first water systems we've put in are all gravity fed. So basically every 120 feet, we have the opportunity to, um, to put in a hose in a trough. Is that the same for the new vineyard at Becky? For the new vineyard, um, no. And that w we haven't set up a water system there yet, and we're trying to figure out how often we'll need to move there. But we do have an irrigation system set up there, so we can tie into that. But I will probably end up tying in something that's separate from the irrigation system there as well. Yes? Um, so in my practice, it's probably about anywhere from 300 to 600. And have you ever done this in the hop yard? No, but we're looking at growing hops, so it's, 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 it's highly possible. I don't know if, if hops is desirable forage for sheep or goats or something like that, but it's worth looking into. Okay, um, in restating the cost savings of that original trial, it was $450 per acre per year, and that was in 2011. And in, in the uh, new vineyard, you said that your design in the trellis is to be higher so that the fruit is and the leaves are out of reach of the sheep. Does, does that change the economics of harvest? I would imagine that it could be more expensive. You're maybe doing yeah. something different. So the uh, the, the question is uh, is um, how does the how does the new trellis system change the economics of, of, of managing that? So there's a couple things. A lot of our a, a lot of our labor in California is from Mexico, and a lot of the labor is pretty small. Mm -hmm. they're, they're pretty short, especially the the people from Oaxaca, and so we've. We, we, we've joked that, um, that we might have to, well, for one thing, a lot, we're losing a lot of our labor. So our, our labor pool is becoming, um, is, is changing. We're not sure what it's going to be. But um, one of the things that we're doing on the second phase of our design is designing that system to be machine harvested because that's the most common way that vines are, 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 grapes are harvested around the world. And so the second phase is going to be designed to be machine harvested. I don't think there'll be any increase in the harvesting cost, we're still within reach, but instead of harvesting like this, you're harvesting like this. Um, the other thing that I forgot to mention is that in the new design, we anticipate that we'll never have to have a vehicle go in there, um, except for harvest. I think by the time that we're ready to start doing, if we have to do any spraying in there, which would be for powdery mildew, that we will be able to use drones in that. And then we would never have to have anything, any equipment going there, which would really help in reducing or eliminating compaction. Yes? Um, in the system you just showed the mob grazing and then following the row crops, what follows those row crops? Um, it goes back into, into um, forage. You cover it and then... Actually, the, the animals, as soon as we harvest, we can graze the animals in there because we've got a diversity of stuff. Yeah. And we even started, we even started plant uh, doing our cover crop as soon as we harvested so that when they came in they had cover crop and the spent uh, you know vegetables and stuff so that they could graze okay. um, so I think this was at Tyson where we transitioned that cropland right you planted it back to pasture you've been grazing it are you going to transition that back to annual crop and if so how okay so the question is are we going to transition from the uh, from the forage crops back to annual crops in the, in the land that we're taking over at Piscinus. And that's a good question. Um, we will probably, work, so everything that we're gonna work with to start with is going to be some things that we don't have issues with food safety. So it could be grain crops, seed crops, uh, something that is canned like canning tomatoes, dried beans, something that is not eaten fresh so they don't have, we don't have food safety issues to deal with. Um, in the meantime, we are doing some, uh, a project with UC Davis on looking at the occurrence of pathogens in food crops when you're adding uh, fresh manure. And so we have some gray sites that they're testing almost probably twice a month or so. 
And so we're going to see what's going on. But we anticipate that as we build our soil quality, that we're going, to, we're going to be working out of the pathogens that are there. And actually, some of the researchers at Davis have already told us that, that that does occur. When you increase your soil health, you have a lot less of those pathogens. So we, uh, if, if that can work, then I would, I would love to be able to go into doing some vegetable crops in there, like leafy greens and things like that. But we need some time to be able to make sure that that is, is all going to. And would you use tillage? Um, that's a great question. I hope not, but we may. We may use some real light tillage. In fact, we're even looking at using some tillage in, in some of the existing fields right now um, with a, a, a tillage implement that can go down anywhere from one to three inches. And I'm still looking for research that shows that we can still maintain our deep carbon, which is the important stuff, using something like that. But that's a real dilemma right now. It's easy to do the no-till for forage but as we're looking at, at vegetables and things, it could be a little tougher. But again, we wanna, we're working at this from a design perspective. So not looking at how do we grow lettuce like they grow lettuce, but looking at it from a design perspective. And maybe lettuce is not even the thing we should be growing because we, we have a culinary school that comes out to the, uh, to the ranch about every three months or so. And they went out to that, to that pasture and they pulled out all the chicory and plantain and a lot of the weeds and made a salad out of it. So maybe we're looking at the wrong stuff to be growing, especially because one of our principles is to increase the nutrient density of the foods we grow. And the, uh, the stuff coming off of there, the vegetables coming off of there, I mean, we had lettuce with bricks of about two to four. So it was really low. Sure, so the, the question is how do we use the animals to, to manage the, uh, the, um, the ground before planting vegetables? And it was, it's, it's actually something that we'd been doing for a while. And we were just using high density grazing and frequent moves and allowing a long period of time for recovery. And so the, uh, I think as you saw in there, they were, they were pretty tight and um, Oftentimes, if we had time, we were moving them as many times uh, during the day as we can. And that allowed the, the, uh, them to graze pretty high off the vegetation. If you can graze, say, 50% or less of the, or leave 50% or more of the, of the plant, then the plant is still able to con con continue cycling carbon into the ground. And so that's one of our goals, is to be able to graze quick enough where the plant doesn't have to shut down and sacrifice roots to continue, to continue growing. So if it graze quickly like that, then the plant is still producing, is still, produce, is still photosynthesizing, sending carbon down, and we're building up that soil carbon. So that's the ideal. And in that situation where we're just taking about six acres out of it at a time, it's fairly easy to do that, that grazing just on that area for sure, um, and, and, and let, the, uh, let that cycling keep occurring. The, the, la the last grazing before going into winter, we did. Actually, stuff was, was basically dormant. But before the ground froze, we grazed that down. Yep. Real low. Real low. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. So if you were, if you were going to take a plot of land that has been overgrazed with you know, animals on it for months at a time and then try to convert it to like a holistic system where you're rotating more frequently, what would be the year one steps? That you would take. Okay, so the question is going from uh, basically poorly managed land that's been overgrazed and, and moving into a, uh, a holistic, uh, moving into holistic management, planned grazing, what would be the first steps? Um, the first step is to stop the overgrazing. So to, to stop that bad practice. And you'll probably see results just from that without doing anything. But then the next step would be to plan your grazing. So, and if it, depending on the climate you're in, it may be that, uh, that planting some type of cover crop, uh, forage slash cover crop is gonna be beneficial to that situation 
and that all ties into your economics and all the various factors that you're working with. Okay, so the question is, where are the animals in winter when the ground's frozen? Um, there's, uh, so that particular ranch at various uh, times has been as large as 120,000 acres. Okay, so it's not necessarily on that same spot. So it's not on that same spot. And often what we do is we, we cut the hay, put it into piles, and, and, and then put, those, uh, put the cattle on those piles in the winter and just strip graze that with, with electric fence. San Luis Valley, south central. So it's about 7,600 feet in elevation and mountains on either side. How, how are we doing on time here? We have about 35 minutes. 35 minutes? So 25 minutes. 25 minutes, okay, all right. Anything else? Okay, I want to I want to talk about the one of the, uh, the the last thing that I wanted to mention. So we've talked about some some of the economic reasons to do this, um, uh, you know, some of the principles that we use, um, and one of the last things that I wanted to talk about, and well, and we we discussed mainly the soil health benefits to, to using livestock. One of the last things I wanted to talk about is quality of life. And um, this is one of the big reasons that I, I, I got into this is because I've been working with livestock all of my life and I really don't like working on tractors. And so for me, this was a, this was a, a, a perfect angle for me to approach this. Um, this is uh, some of our staff here, none of who like to work on equipment either. Um, so, we don't, we don't do apprenticeships at our place. Um, we, we hire people because one of the things that I've found is that when you hire somebody that um, they don't expect to be taught, but they take the learning into their own hands. And so we've had more success with that. Um, uh, the majority of our staff is pretty young. Um, and uh, for instance, this, this guy closest here actually grew up on one of the first organic farms in the state, uh, a grain farm, and he's never had any experience with livestock. And so he was really curious as to what that would mean to be incorporating livestock on the farm. Um, he has, uh, in, in talking to his mom, he found out that his dad, his dad was, or his grandfather was a sheep herder. And she can remember when she was a kid that his dad was running about 7,000 sheep across the desert in Arizona. So he's kind of getting back to his roots a little bit there. But um, I think one of the things that's really important is, to, is that a lot of what we're doing is new, which is another reason why we, we, we don't have apprenticeships there is because a lot of people that are trying to get into something like this want to learn the basics. And we're trying to figure out a lot of new stuff. So it can be kind of stressful for somebody who wants to be an apprentice when we're trying so many different things and a lot of stuff doesn't work. And, and it's, it can be frustrating. So it's a, it's a pretty um, creative process, and we have um, some creative people. Um, we do a lot of the livestock work on foot or uh, horseback, and partly that's a, that's a quality of life thing too. Jess is, the, is our main shepherd, and she's responsible for the sheep. And she likes to ride horses, so she's been working the sheep on horseback a bit. And we almost never will, will work the livestock with something like a, a four-wheeler or a car or, or a, a, a four-wheel drive vehicle or a motorcycle. We pretty much like to do it on foot or um, horseback. And it's a, uh, it's a different way of thinking about how you farm because you're, you're, again, you're getting away from this high input system and looking at how you use sunlight and, the th and, and living organisms to manage your land. How are you marketing the livestock? Okay, the question is how do we market the livestock? We just started marketing sheep this year. The, the ranch has historically been a grass finished cattle operation. Um, when I took over management 
uh, about two years ago, we started, we, we actually got rid of all the cattle on there, in part because we were in a serious drought. So it kind of made sense to, it was a good time to get rid of the cattle. There weren't that many on there. And we, um, we started building up a sheep flock. And we did that because we have found that on the same forage, when the cattle are losing weight, the sheep are getting fat. And one of our biggest problems is, is keeping the sheep from getting too fat there, which is a good problem to have, especially those of you who are, are working on finishing livestock know how tough it can be to, to, to finish cattle sometimes. And so the sheep are really easy. In fact, our, we, we, we have to spend a lot of time getting them to lose weight so that we can breed them back without getting too many triplets. Um, so we're switching over to sheep. And to start with, we don't have that many. We're, we're selling most of them to, by word of mouth right now. And our intention is, because we, we're looking at getting up to probably about 1,000 ewes, which will give us about 3,000 sheep on the ranch at any time. But that'll give us uh, a lot of sheep to market. So the first thing we're doing, we're about an hour away from San Jose and then the rest of the Bay Area. So we've got millions of people uh, as a potential market close by, kind of similar to right here. And so we're trying to sell as much as we can. By word of mouth, we're going to restaurants and um, uh, butcher shops and just trying to develop people that are interested in this. And we also have a lot of people that come to the ranch. So we have uh, Airbnb there. We have events occurring constantly. And so we're trying to make one of the sales outlet just people coming to the ranch. Um, in about three years, I'll have a better answer to that question overall, because I'm not sure which direction it's going to go, but I think it's going to go to numerous directions. But the, uh, the, all the sheep that we raise are hair sheep. The meat quality is, is really good. And um, I'm hoping, I, I think a large part of our marketing strategy is going to be education, because lamb is not very popular. But most people have never tried lamb that is raised like this and from these hair sheep breeds. Well, those are some of the resources that might be interesting to you. Yep. Uh, good eye. There's a there's a there's a few churros, or part churros in there, and um, um, yeah, that one over that one over in the corner there probably has some churro, and that is probably um, that might be about May or so. So that some of those hair sheep have probably still not lost all their wool. Okay, so the question's, question is basically on the economics of this operation and how willing are people to pay for this stuff that's, where, that's actually costing us money to try out these ideas. Um, so uh, again, we, our, our, our first harvest this year, well, we still have a little bit to go, but it's probably only about 30 to 40 animals. And we, we haven't had an issue so far selling that stuff. We have some people already coming back for more. Um, as far as the overall economics of this, it's it's um, that's a really good question. The 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 vineyard operation. So in a normal vineyard development, you're basically clearing the land and planting your vines, and you've got about three years before you get any income. In this system, we are making money right off the get-go because we are putting in forage crops slash cover crops. And so immediately we have an income from either leasing that ground. So we, we do lease a lot of the rangeland there and, and then fattening animals, finishing animals on there, raising animals on there. So the income is, is, is immediate in that regard. So that's helping to offset. And especially for a, a smaller vineyard, 
that's a, that's pretty desirable because you can you can have your income right off the get go, and you don't necessarily have to to have a breeding flock on your vineyard if, if you're small. You can bring in animals. You could buy animals, buy lambs, run them on there, finish them, and then sell them at the end of the year, which is what I was doing when we had that when we were doing that early trial. I just bought animals in December or so and ran them through June, and in that case, I put them in my freezer. So, yes. Talking about how you don't have apprentices, you just hire people, and that part of that is because you're trying all these new things, and things you know you, you learn a lot as you go, and things don't work out. Can you talk about some of the things that didn't work, mm -hmm. like things that you would consider fails, that but that were valuable for a learning? Yeah. Uh, so the um, the the new vineyard that um, that we just planted um, is 12 and a half acres. We put about we didn't plant all of it, but we planted about 6,000 vines. We put grow tubes up on every vine, so it's a plastic tube. And the, the, there's a grafted vine, so they're sticking out of the ground about that far. And they start leafing out in these grow tubes, and they grow up out of the grow tube. The grow tubes we put up, uh, a lot of times they're used in conventional vineyards because they protect the vine from getting sprayed by an herbicide. We put those up primarily to keep uh, rodents off of it. And in about... Oh, so we, had, we actually had vines up about this high. They were doing really well. But we started noticing in some of the smaller vines that they're, they're being chewed on a little bit. I thought it might be earwigs or something like that. And then a few vines having damage went to almost every vine having damage in about a week. And I still had no idea what it was. And finally, I set up a wildlife camera. And it was squirrels. It was ground squirrels. And my first shot in the wildlife camera was a squirrel butt going down into a grow tube. And I didn't think, A, I didn't think they would do that, and I didn't think they could go down there and turn around and get back out. And so we, um, well, so because of that, we lost about 3,000 vines to squirrels. And because we'd, we'd, we've had two wet years in California, and um, the rodent population in general has been huge. A lot of farmers I've talked to have, have had issues with that. So. Um, and then we also, because of the rains, a lot of our grafted material uh, in the nursery, the soil went anaerobic and some of that stuff budded out and the buds just stayed that big for, throughout the growing season. So all of those are being replaced by the nursery. So we had a pretty big failure in our first year of planting. Um, so, which is pretty disheartening. Um, so that's, that's one of the big ones we had and that was, uh, um, I've dealt with squirrels in every vineyard I've ever managed, but that's the first time I've seen something like that. And so that's, that's um, and for instance, the, the, the cropland that we're taking over, setting up that irrigation system, figuring out what to plant. I mean, it's, it's a constant, it's, it's a, we're constantly learning how to do things better. And it's, 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 it's really a daily thing, looking at what's going on. So, and it's, uh, it, it is interesting to see the people. So we do, we do have a couple of people that don't have much experience there. And watching them, their frustration with those things as compared to people who have been around agriculture and realizing this is, this is just the way it is. Yeah. So, but we've compounded that by all of the experimentation that we're doing. So, and, and there's, I, I've, I've had apprentices sitting down and crying and saying, I just don't, it, it just makes no sense, you know, what, what, what's, what's going on here, so. Uh, and what might you okay, so the question is, do we, do, does our planning encourage or in, include biodiversity, including biodiversity in our, in our planning and plantings? Yes, and that's our, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. So the, the whole vineyard design, we're donating, we're donating, we're, 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 uh, we're, we're using about 2% of every vine space. So say we have you know, 12,000 vines in there or something. We'll use 2% of that space for other plants besides grapevines. And that's where a vine might normally have been. And so we're going to be planting um, small trees, bushes, some native plants in there, um, hummingbird habitat, 
um, native plant, native plants, pollinator plants. So in the in, in those where the vine might be, but we're also doing that in in the in the vineyard alleys, and we can do that because we're not we're not doing any tillage, we're not doing any mowing, so we can plant whatever we want in there. So it's going to look like a pretty diverse meadow, and because of the the, the way we're building up the organic matter, if that continues, which I suspect it'll continue for a little while anyway, at, the, at that rate or close to that rate, that the water holding capacity will be improved. Our anticipation is that in a, in a normal year, we'll be able to dry farm that vineyard. We have irrigation in there to establish it, but in a normal year, whatever normal is anymore, we'll be able to, to dry farm that. But our anticipation is one of our principles that we're working on is when we take over cropland, that we don't just have biodiversity, but that we have biodiversity at a level that um, is comparable to a, a really healthy part of the ranch. So it's, we've already increased the biodiversity at the vineyard site from what it started at. Uh, we've probably doubled the amount of biodiversity in there. But that's a pretty low mark because it was just annual grassland. So, but our, our intention is that we'll look at what, what's, a, what's a healthy example on the ranch and, 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 and try and mimic that at least, uh, it, maybe not completely in species, but in function and, and, and just numbers and diversity. Sure. Uh, during the vineyard portion, you mentioned you were using drones. How are you using those? So um, the, the question is, uh, it goes back to the idea of using drones in the vineyard. So we haven't used them yet, but I've been watching them, and they're making small drones now that um, allow, that, that are for spraying. And you can actually program these, because the vineyard is on a hillside, to follow the, 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 the slopes and everything. And so you can program them. They'll go down and do the spraying, and then they come back and you fill them up. And so these are already available out there now. The first ones cost $120,000, and I think now they're down to $5,000. So by, you know, in three years when we're ready to use something like this, I think it'll be pretty affordable. Um, Along that line, we anticipate needing to use very little spraying. It'll probably mainly be for, for uh, fungus, fungal diseases. But there is, um, there's good evidence and research showing that a grazing animal imparts disease and pest resistance to the plants that it grazes. Um, if a plant didn't want to be grazed, they have all kinds of, of mechanisms for creating that, thorns, toxins, and things like that. So in general, when a plant allows itself to be grazed, it's getting benefits. Grapevines, obviously, have never adapted to, be not, to, to, to prevent grazing, so there's probably some type of benefit that's occurring there. We, uh, we expect that it'll probably be in, in pest resistance, so, and they're still waiting to see what that, what that will be. Yes. Is your experience solely in grazing livestock like beef and sheep, or do you have any experience in holistic management of swine in a pasture system? Okay, so the, the question is using um, pigs in a pasture system, and I have never used pigs in a pasture system, and we have actually a lot of feral pigs on the ranch, um, and so one of the first things that we had to do in putting up the vineyard was to put a fence to keep pigs out because they could they could cause a lot a, a lot of damage, especially to the young vines. Um, uh, there is a fair bit of interest on the ranch at, at looking at using pigs, and I expect we'll probably try those in the in the pastures. Again, I just want to make sure that we can improve soil health and still use pigs. And so I'm interested in if if anybody has experience in that. Uh, so that, yes, so that the question is the planting density of the vineyard. We used 12 foot between rows and 6 foot between vines. Um, the historic uh, average dry farming in California is 10 by 10, so 100 square feet per vine. We're, we're doing uh, 76, 72, and um, we're doing that because we are increasing our organic matter and anticipate that we can get by with a little bit closer spacing. and. I mean, part of the reason to do this is, is, a, is an example to other vineyards. So um, we want it to be viable, not to, you know, like a 12 by 12 or something that's, that nobody's doing anymore. But we think that we'll be able to still be able to dry farm that at that spacing. And what 
the rootstock we're using is almost, probably 95% is 1103. We do have a little bit 110R in there too. Yes. Um, so the question is managing for competition uh, after planting the vines, but before we can bring the sheep into graze. Um, I'll have a better idea of that in a year. Um, so this year, after planting, we we actually we 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 grazed immediately after planting, um, but haven't grazed. We didn't graze after that, and we didn't have any issues with competition. Our main issue was 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 with the squirrels. Um, from my experience in the vineyards that I've planted, where the weeds do really well, or, or your, whatever you have growing in there, the vines do really well too. And so I haven't had any issues with that. Um, and I don't expect that we will have issues, but it's possible that we could have something really vigorous that comes up right by a vine that can compete with it, which would be easy enough to take care of. So, And we will um, we'll continue using grow tubes. So. Uh, we can graze until the vines start popping out of that grow tube, which should put us um, pretty close to the end of the growing season because we're not irrigating the, uh, the vineyard floor, just the sites where the vines are. Okay. All right. It's it, all of your experience in arid climates? Okay, uh, is all my experience in arid climates? Um, yes. <laughs> How long were you in the Mediterranean? So um, I've been in California. The first round was for, I've been in there a total of about nine years now on two separate occasions. And I actually, I, I went through the, uh, through the farm and garden apprenticeship at UC Santa Cruz. So um, I, I had a little bit of training in those areas. And you mentioned you spent time in, in the Mediterranean and Europe? No, that's just in a Mediterranean just climate. climate. Yep, yep, gotcha. yep, yep. I have spent time in Spain and Australia. So. Um, any fire, wild or managed? Any fire? fire. Um, we have not had fires where we are. We're, we're extremely prone to them. I mean, we haven't had any on the ranch. That's not true. We did have a fire jump, jump the fence last year, but we haven't had anything serious. Um, we, this year could have potentially been really bad as it was further north of us um, because we had so much vegetation on the ground. But um, we, we, we didn't have any issues this year. What kind of work are you doing on your genetics? Okay, so the question is uh, genetics of the sheep flock and what type of work are we doing? So basically, we are calling really heavily right now to, uh, to select mothers that can produce, you know, at least two lambs in this climate. And so if something's not doing well, we, we call her the, the, the first year. Um, so in order to, so that, we, that our basis for the flock is good. And we are primarily using Katahdin sheep we have considered bringing in some outside breeds that have a little bit more wild um, genes in them, but at this point, they're they're doing pretty good. So, so not not so much work on carcass yield quite yet. We, we haven't had any issues with that. The our estimated carcass yields were uh, probably we were anticipating 55 to 60 pounds. The lowest we had was 105 pounds. For for so we we harvest it at a year or later, uh, yep, yep. And we could harvest earlier if somebody wanted true lamb, but we find the quality is so much better. You get good fat and 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 the flavor is incredible. Yep. This is a follow up. Have you had any issues marketing that the older animals as opposed to what people would conventionally think of as So far, not. But that's going to be a big part of our marketing is educating people. And the best way to do that is let people try it because they're, they're just blown away when they, when they taste it. 
Okay, so we need to fill out some evaluations. If you all need help, just ask me over. <laughs> thank, you. thank you all. Thank you.